Hello, friends. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Fort Worth Roots. This is a podcast for Fort Worthians who love our city and want stories from our community's creators. You love Fort Worth? You want to know what's happening in your backyard? Then this podcast is made for you. You can find Fort Worth Roots on all the major podcast players, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, uh, Apple Podcast, wherever you listen. You can find it there. You can stream it off of our website, www.fortworthroots.com. Dot com On all social media, we're simply Fort Worth Roots. You can find that on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and we have videos of these episodes up on YouTube. Big shout out to our friends over at SquadSTX.com. If you've been listening over the past eight weeks, you know that we've been covering these guys. Squad STX Boys Camping. I wanted to do something for the community with this time that we had at the front of the episodes uh, instead of sponsorship, since we don't have any currently. So we reached out to the local veteran entrepreneur community and said, hey, let us uh, talk about your business. Squad STX Boys Camping was the first one to get back to us. Squad STX is an overnight primitive camping, hiking, orienteering, and laser tag course for boys designed by U.S. Army infantry officers as an alternative to Boy Scouts. We develop strong leadership skills through squad competitions, time-tested military training methodologies, and situational training exercises. Take your boys outside. This is for ages 10 through 16. It's all boys, 100% outdoors, overnight camping, hiking, wilderness skills and navigation, and laser tag missions. Check it out online, squadstx.com. If you're listening to last week's episode, episode 70 with Joe Guzman, uh, we talked about the event that he put together at Maine at Southside. This happened April 15th through April 17th. Uh, the event's called Psychedelic Panther. It's at Maine at Southside, like I just said, three days, two stages, 29 bands, art vendors. It's going to be great. Uh, this first time they've done this, and Joe has really put uh, every ounce of himself into this. And he wants to do a uh, annual thing where you're getting all the local musicians together and uh, just just having a blowout event. It's going to be really cool, and you gotta got to put this one on your calendar. I don't think anybody's expecting you to go to all three days. You can definitely go to all three days if you wanted to, but there's an entire week in there where you can decide what day works best for you. Go out, catch some live music, show your uh, support for the local artist community, and do the thing. Psychedelic Panther, April 15th through the 17th. Uh, that is going to be at Maine at Southside. And the event that we've been talking about this for a long time. We are finally in the month of April, so the countdown has begun. The River Oaks Spring Fest Car Show, Saturday, April 30th. If you haven't already marked it on your calendars, please do so. This is the first time we're going to take uh, Fort Worth Roots out to an uh, event like this. It's going to be pretty awesome. Oscar Meyer Wienermobile is going to be there. They're going to have a uh, bounce house, vendors and pop-up markets, games and events. And this is all going to be benefiting the Friends of the River Oaks Animal Shelter uh, and YMCA Camp Carter. The place is beautiful. It's 320, 360 acres, something like that, of just open, beautiful fields with all sorts of activities packed in between. Uh, you got to come check it out. And if nothing else, come out there just to say hi to Fort Worth Roots Podcast. We'll have the banner out. I'll be taking pictures with folks, and I've got a couple other squirrely ideas that we're going to try to work into the whole thing. But And that is going to be at 6200 Sand Springs Road, Fort Worth, Texas. You have to use the address. You will not find this place. If you don't know where it's at already, you, you got to use the address. Don't go over there thinking you're just going to like stumble upon it. That's not how this works. Stay tuned to the very end of this episode. There are a lot of things that we covered in here that I want to address for you. It's also going to make its way into the show notes, too. But there's restaurant suggestions and links and things that need to be discussed. So our guest today is somebody that has done everything in Hollywood that you can possibly do for the film industry. He's been a producer, a director, an actor, a stuntman. And uh, you will know him best as Raphael in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the early 1990s. There were three movies. And if you're anywhere near my age group, you definitely remember these shows, uh, these movies, these films, these flicks, whatever you call them. Um, that, was, that was our guest today. And we got linked up with him thanks to a mutual friend of ours named Donnie Bovine from the Success Champions. This was a couple of years back, and we've been trying to put this together. And it, it's just been one mess after another, and coronavirus got us all screwed up. But anyway, we finally made it happen. We had the opportunity to uh, record with our guests today at a place called Nexum Creative Media. You can find this place on, uh, on the internet at Nexum, 
nexumcreative.com is n-e-x-m creative.com i didn't get a chance to bend the ear of the owner his guy's name is paul and it's a friend of our guest and uh i would really like to know how he managed to put this place together because i'm telling you it is incredible um different studios for different types of projects and we were able to use a room that is specifically set up for basically what we're doing podcasting so um Big shout out to Paul. Thank you for letting us use that space. And uh, hopefully one day we can get you on the show and talk a little bit about Nexum Creative and what all is going on at that place. But from what I can tell, folks, if you have any kind of recording needs or you need to do a photo shoot with a big, crazy, huge, blank white wall, like I said, I don't have the details on this, but this place is awesome. It would be a great connection for anybody doing any kind of creative work, uh, whether it's photography, podcasting, or otherwise. So check that out on the web, nexumcreative.com. As everybody knows by now, there is a huge backlog for these episodes. I record constantly, and then we've only been putting stuff out on Mondays. I am going to continue to to guarantee you an episode every single Monday, and we are going to start putting out episodes on Thursdays, but those are not guaranteed, and here's why. I don't want you to get used to Thursday releases. (laughs) It's a lot of work, two episodes a week. So um, anyway, I'm going to put the pedal to the metal. I'm going to put the my nose to the grindstone, whatever you want to call it. I'll be banging out two episodes every week through the month of April trying to clear this backlog. Anyway, all that to say, we did this recording a month ago, okay? And it is the 4th of, excuse me, it is currently the 3rd of April. And last night, I got to run into the guest that we have on today with his brother. His brother is actually the front man for the band, The Traumatics. And they were playing at Twilight last night. So I got to hang out with the whole crew, take videos, shoot pictures, and or the other way around, whatever. Shoot some pictures, take some shots. I don't know. It's been a long weekend. And now that I've actually gotten to hang out with this dude, I can tell you that these people are just nonstop fun to be around. Just great people. Very creative, sincerely nice folks, and uh, can't wait to see them again. Remember, stay to the end of the episode. I've got more notes to put out, but I've got to stop talking so that we can get this episode started. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to Fort Worth Roots. Thank you for streaming this episode. Please give it up for our guest today, the very accomplished Ken Scott. Let's start the show. I know there was a little bit of pushback whenever you found out that I wanted to do it in person. But I oh, I was, I'm just so used. I'm so used to for the last year and a half. It's all just been online, right? Everything it just surprised me that you wanted to do it. Doesn't you know? Yeah, so I'm all good with it. Well, I appreciate your time. I wanted to start off by asking you about Fort Worth places that you like to hang out, restaurants around here that you enjoy. You know, um, coming from Los Angeles, one of the things that I really enjoyed out there was the eclectic culinary scene, mm. and I I I consider myself what I call a food adventurer. Okay, I like to find places that are maybe off the beaten path or, you know, the, the typical hole in the wall that has good food. In a place like Los Angeles, you can find a variety of cultures, a variety of foods, and um, different iterations of foods from the same country and all that. So it's, it's a wide uh, expanse, um, a territory of food out there. Coming to Fort Worth was a big change for me from a food point of view because, A, I moved here as a vegetarian. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. And um, I am now no longer a vegetarian <laughs> yeah. living in Texas. Uh, after a while, the delicious smells of barbecue and steak and burgers and everything will certainly get to you. But I was already cycling out of it uh, when I was leaving Los Angeles. I, I had told my girlfriend at the time, you know, I think I'm going to eat some meat pretty soon. I was just feeling it in the air. And then Texas just made it in- inevitable. <laughs> It was manifest destiny, really. Do you remember what it was exactly that got you to break out of your vegan diet? Oh, yeah. It was a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> it was the very first thing I ate. I, I, I bought a pepperoni pizza, and I took it home. And I was kind of concerned because it had been 25 years since I'd eaten any meat. Mm. And um, I opened it, and I, I put the pizza on my coffee table in front of me, and I just stared at it for a while. And it was like, well, this is the point of no return. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it was one of those pizzas with the pepperoni where the pepperoni cups up and it fills up with oil oil, like a pitcher plant. (laughs) And I just looked at it and I, so I I reached out and I just picked up one piece of pepperoni and I just, and I ate it and I was like, oh my God, that's delicious. (laughs) 
So I ate like two or three slices of the pizza. I didn't want to eat too much because I didn't want to get sick. Over the course of the next two or three days, I ate that whole pizza. And uh, once I didn't get sick... Then I just went on a crazy ride and went to every fast food restaurant I could. I, w- I went to McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and ate all that. But your original question was in Fort Worth. Uh, I was lucky enough to discover uh, some of these places on my food adventures in Fort Worth. So I actually have sort of a, a short list of places that I take people to when they come to visit me here. There's a uh, One of my favorites is a Vietnamese restaurant called Pho Hung on Camp Bowie. Okay. Um, a friend of mine uh, named Lee uh, runs that place. Uh, it's delicious. For Mexican food, um, I found two places, uh, both on the north side of Fort Worth. One is called uh, Los Asaderos on Main Street. Uh, it's a family-owned place, and it's for me, it's the most authentic Mexican food I've got going around. I always bring people there for the delicious mole and stuff like that. What was the name of that? Uh, it's Los Asaderos. I don't know that I've been there. Yeah. It used to be called El Asadero, <laughs> but then the two people that owned it apparently got divorced and someone kept the name and somebody <laughs> had to change the name and all this kind of stuff. So, um, what's the second one? Uh, the second one is right around the corner from that because as we know, in the north side of Fort Worth, you can stand on one corner and see 12 Mexican restaurants all within the same uh, sight lines. Amen. The other one's called uh, Nuevo Leon. And the reason I found Nuevo Leon was because coming from Los Angeles, I'm a big fan of ceviche. Oh, yeah. And um, as many people may or may not be aware, in North Texas, here in the center of the country, it's not easy to get fresh seafood. No. If at all. So to find a place that even served um, some ceviche that was tasty and delicious That's was a real decent. joy. Yeah. So so there was that. Now, did they na- the, the, the ceviche that they have, is it does it compare to what you had in L.A.? Well, there's different kinds, you sure, know, sure. and I'll say for uh, for Dallas and Fort Worth area, it's delicious. Okay. Love it. Um, and then for me, you know, I, I mean, I could go on and on about the different restaurants, but for me, it all really comes down to my favorite food in the world is actually pizza. Um, I, you know, uh, pizza has been a thing my whole life. Um, I've got a tattoo of pizza on my <laughs> leg. Um, I've done a pizza pop up. Uh, at Black Cat Pizza with some local chefs, Kevin Martinez um, and Chef Jaime over at uh, Black Cat Pizza. We did a pizza pop-up one time. But uh, I'm a big fan of um, uh, Joe's Pizza around the city. There's all different Joe's. Yeah. Heisen's Pizza on University and Zoli's on Hewlin because they have... Zoli's. Yeah, Zoli's has the... As a matter of fact, I just ate there today. (laughs) They have uh, the best pizza oven you can buy. They have a... Pizza Master, which comes okay. from, I think it's uh, Switzerland. It's a $20,000 ceramic deck oven. Oh, it's beautiful. Damn, we're going to have to yeah. check that out. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely try those out. Have you been to uh, Coco Shrimp? I have, yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, it's good. It's very basic, but they've, they've got a couple items and they stick to it. Yeah, I think they've, na- they've nailed what they're doing and they do a good job at it. Yeah, that, that whole area right there has just got so much new stuff. Yeah, I've, I remember when that... When there was nothing there, I used mm-hmm. to work. I, yeah. I used to record music at a studio over there on Main Street, uh, Fort Worth uh, Sound, and there was nothing there. It was just yeah. empty, and you you worried about where you're going to park your car. And then several years ago, they started putting in those colored crosswalks with the brick and stuff. And all of a sudden, I was like, "What are they doing here?" And now, wow, what a fantastic job they've done of developing that part just of the city. Just in the last three, four years. Yeah, it's magnificent, and hopefully, it continues to spread down Main Street. Uh, all the way past the dairy that's down there. There's another bar on the other side of the dairy called Mass. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I, I go to a lot of live music here in Fort Worth and yeah. spend a lot of time at that place. So hopefully all that uh, development continues on down there. Yeah. I'm glad you know about Mass. Fort Worth Roots has a bunch of musician friends that, that frequent that place. And uh, it's kind of a hot spot. Yeah. And there's a big event coming up. I think it's April 15th with one of our new friends that just did a recording with us. And uh, they're actually bringing people from other countries to go to Mass to play for like a reunion tour. Oh, that's so fantastic. Mass is awesome. I've been there once. I need to go check out more stuff there. But there's so much going on in between where I live and Mass that I get caught up on the way there. You know, you got Lola's and uh, all the other places that the local bands play uh, before you get there. So have you been to Lola's? I was just there yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've probably been to Lola's more than any other yeah, you know, it's real late spot bad. in the city. It's one of our favorite spots. Yeah. Uh, the Traumatics, that's your uh, brother's band, and they they play at Mass. Yes, they do. Yeah, he's got some event coming up, but I didn't get the uh, the details totally ironed out, so I didn't want to 
uh, bring it up yet. I, I they, think the Traumatics are playing uh, next at Twilight on April 2nd. I believe that's, that's their next gig. Yeah. Yeah. And I had some kind of question about it, so I didn't put it in there. But um, tell me about the Traumatics. Do you ever play with those guys? You do play uh, bass, guitar, and drums yourself, don't you? Yeah. I've, I've been a musician ever since I was a, you know, a pubescent kid. <laughs> And uh, my brother Steve is just a couple of years older than me. He's a hand surgeon uh, here in the area. He's up in the South Lake area. And we played music a lot together when we were younger. Our first band was when um, we were in high school. Our band was called the Dipshits. <laughs> and um, so we played together for a while. So we played music together our whole lives. And then I moved to Los Angeles and he moved to Texas. Uh, we're not from here. We grew up in North Carolina. So he moved here after getting with a practice after medical school and we kind of did our own thing, but whenever we got together, we played music. So we've been playing and jamming for a long time together. And then um, I was jamming with another friend of mine, uh, a guy named David Cross, and David uh, plays bass. And um, we just started playing and we started playing with my brother and all, we all of a sudden started having a good time. And then my brother kind of got inspired and we were going out and seeing other bands. We were going to Mass and Lola's and Magnolia Motor Lounge and all that. And I remember one day, it was it was very similar to my story when I was a kid in the movie theaters to figuring out what I wanted to do in, in my life. But my brother, here he was doing it in his 50s. He, I, he looked at a band on stage and he turned to me and he goes, you know, I think I could do that. And so from that moment forward, um, he really got inspired and started pursuing writing music again he was his whole like spirit was reinvigorated with like a, re a musical renaissance what year would you say that was man that was uh, right before covid hit okay so 2020 i guess the end of 2019 yeah it's kind of the gist i was getting is it's, it seemed like kind of a new thing but yeah not new as far as uh y'all playing together y'all uh making your own music that's been going on for a lifetime but yeah no the traumatics took off just right before covid hit um Steve basically started to put together a band. He found a great bass player, Baby Leg, who is this uh, mythological sort of figure uh, okay. that uh, travels the land with a bass on his back, and <laughs> now he's playing with the Traumatics. Um, and then they've they've been through a couple of drummers. They've got uh, uh, Dan. His nickname is Sonic Boom. He's their drummer now. But, um, yeah, they started playing, and my brother kind of said, you know, he, he sort of extended to me, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And... Um, I played in bands in Los Angeles and we played, I was in a very successful band that played all up and down the Sunset Strip and everything. So I know what it takes to be in a band and to play live and all that. And I wasn't interested in that. Yeah. Much less interested in being a drummer and doing that because drummers get it the worst. They got to carry all the shit wherever <laughs> they're going and it's the worst of anybody. Singers have it the easiest, then guitar players or bass players, then guitar players, and then the drummers have it the worst. So I didn't want to be responsible for carting all this stuff. At the same time, um, this was the first time my brother was going off on a creative endeavor on his own outside of being the brilliant doctor that he already is. And it was important for him to go on this journey on his own and learn how to work with other musicians and manage and all that. And he did not have an experience of background in entertainment like I do. So he kind of needed to figure all that stuff out himself. And I think that was an important part of the journey. So him, so he kind of took off with those guys to do their thing yeah. and uh, they became the traumatics and outside of anybody that lives with a member of the traumatics, I'm their number one fan. I'm at all the shows. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was the first thing I uh, came to mind, you know, finding out that you played all these instruments and your brother has a band. Surely I'll gig a little bit, but it, it's nice to know you got the wisdom to say, eh, I'd like to, I could, but no, you go do your thing. Yeah. There's a, yeah. There's a <laughs> lot going on, you know, and I've, it, at the same time, I'm also trying to pursue my things. I wrote at the time that he was doing that. I was, um, I think my book had just come out. Um, I was starting another one, so I have all my own kind of projects that were being worked on, and and it was great. And now I see all the success they're having, and it's wonderful. His, his band's got songs on the radio now, and uh, at TCU and on uh, KXT, and um, yeah, they're doing great. He was he just won Dallas Songwriter of the Year. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think I've reached out to him before, and I, I don't, real quick, before I forget, Donnie uh, from 
Success Champions. That's oh, where yeah, that's we where we got connected like two years ago. Okay. And you and I, we, we've been messaging back and forth. Um, I'm sure you message back and forth with a lot of people, but uh, we finally made it happen, got connected. Um, somewhere in the middle of that, I think I've exchanged uh, messages with them, not knowing the connection between you and them. So uh, maybe eventually they'll be on the show, but that would be awesome. So I, I intentionally avoided the biggest piece of, of your publicly visible history uh, my porn career your porn career yeah exactly right. all day today i've been searching your information i like to do it last minute so that it sticks in my head and i still take notes but uh i started look, looking for a uh, podcast and i found about a hundred different podcasts that you've been on and what i realized uh almost immediately is that every single one of them asks you the same questions um which is you know to be expected right um, but I wanted to make sure that we got plenty of extra material about Ken, not just uh, Raphael. Well, whatever you think is going to hold people's <laughs> interest to listen to the podcast, if if we think people are interested in who I am outside of well, that movie stuff, sure. Listen, I'm uh, going to, there was a... I think I'm fabulously interesting. You are. I know we only have about, what, an hour today with, with Ken, so I wanted to make sure that we covered some more material that, that people haven't covered at nauseum, and I, I could hear <laughs> you talking to some of these podcasters. It's like, okay, and then you start on your spill, telling the whole story. So, well, that's, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book originally that I did write is right. because after a while, you know, I've been doing this now for thirty years, and you run into people, and there's a lot of the same questions over and over. Right. And that's why I usually ask, I don't know if we did this, but I usually ask podcasters, my, the one demand I have is they got to read my book before right. we do the interview. I don't know if we did. I think We didn't talk about it. In fact, I, uh, I actually did not know that you'd written a book until uh, we had set up a time to do this. Okay. And so I didn't have time to get that book. I will be reading that book. And I also know you have another book that you're working on. And uh, whenever you have that up for release and you're ready to talk about it on the show, It'll be I will... I will have read that book, and we'll be ready to promote the next one. <laughs> It'll be a hot minute. Well, that's, okay. why I wrote, that's why I wrote the book originally, is because after 30 years, you see a lot of the same questions coming up. You know, how, hey, how did you get that job? <laughs> um, was it hot in that suit? Yeah. Uh, a lot of that stuff. So I was able to go through the book and take all these stories that I've told at Comic-Cons and interviews and on the right. radio and all this stuff and put it all together and take all the answers that any fan of the Ninja Turtle movies would want to ask. That has asked. Yeah, probably. that has asked. You know. And even ones that they haven't asked. There's stories that in this book that people don't know anything about that go beyond the typical surface stuff of where do the turtles come from and what are their names and things like that. Yeah. And literally talks about the pain and suffering and blood, sweat, and tears that literally blood, sweat, and tears that go into making a costume movie and working with all the people and stuff like that. So... Um, I realize that people want to know these stories. So I don't ever get tired of telling them or anything like that. I mean, it's been a great part of my life. And the fact that Ninja Turtles has touched so many people and it gives me the opportunity to share that with them. And, you know, for me, my experience is very different. Everybody, everybody always asks me, hey, did you see this Ninja Turtle movie and did you do that? And the truth of the matter is, I don't have any Ninja Turtle stuff in my house. Like, right. There's not statues of Raphael. And <laughs> there's nothing. Um, I don't go see all the, you know, the Michael Bay Ninja Turtle movies or anything like that because my whole experience is on the other side of the mask looking right. out rather than looking towards. So for me to be able to meet people where this has become the mythology of their life. You know, this is, for me, it was Star Wars growing up, right? That was the heroic journey, as Joseph Campbell talks about. Now, for a whole other generation of people that are in their 30s to 40 now, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is their mythology. And they look back on that like that's their childhood. I can't tell you how many times I've been at Comic-Cons and stuff, and the, the line that people say to me is, man, you were my childhood. And yeah. so I get to be the recipient of, of people sharing their joy and love yeah. and unbridled passion that they have, not for me necessarily, but for the turtles. Right. I just happen to represent that for them. So I've been at comic cons where people literally, they break down into tears. They start shaking. Um, 
as I, I was just at a Comic Con in, in Belgium, in Brussels, and a girl came over and she had a tattoo of Raphael on her arm, and she had me sign below the tattoo, and she went right away and got my signature tattooed onto her arm. I saw that picture. That yeah. is awesome. <laughs> and when she said that, she goes, I want you to sign here. I'm going to get a tattooed. I was like, are you sure you want to do that? She was like, yeah, absolutely. No pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? It's so funny. When, when people bring stuff to the cons, if, if somebody comes to my table and they want an autograph picture, no problem. If I mess up a name or something, right. I just tear it, start a new one. Right. But sometimes people bring me like original movie posters or oh, or three hundred dollar action figures that they've collected and things like that, and they unroll and they're like, "Hey man, here's a thirty year old movie poster. I want you to sign it." And I'm like, "Oh gosh, I hope I don't mess up anything or whatever, and hope my pen doesn't run out of ink halfway through." So when this girl's telling me she's going to get a tattoo, I'm like, "Oh, this is the most hardcore signing I've ever had to do," but. With all that stuff, it's just so wonderful to be able to share that with them and, and see how it's touched the world and to be part of it on that side and, and share that experience. It's really great. Yeah. Um, I, I loved hearing that story. And with every single podcast that you've been on, you've told it a little bit different. And uh, there were some people that did great jobs interviewing you, and I hope I get to put my name in the list with those guys. And then there's some guys that just really botched it, and I was cringing the whole time for you. There's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big joke that I have with my friends, and I'm sure you're aware of it. Is, um, it's the old Chris Farley, you know, where they go, you know that scene in the movie you did where you came out and you, you kicked that guy? That was cool. <laughs> And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like, they're sitting, like, they're doing an interview. Yeah, like this. yeah that's yeah. the interview. And I'm like, is mm -hmm. that a question? I'm like, yeah, yeah that was cool. Well, we're talking so. about the same one, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to drop any names, but that it was there was one. Yeah. Well, everybody's <laughs> everybody's figuring it out. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. There's there's no rules here, and that's the fun thing about podcasting. Um, but the one thing I I did want to really divert our attention to a, a little bit outside of the. Uh, Raphael story was your journey into martial arts because I, I heard you say this several times it's been a very very important part of your life and um, you got started uh, at age 12 um, you were playing soccer and then transitioned into martial arts and your father told you that he'd pay for it <laughs> unless you dropped it and then you were paying for it right what a hell of an incentive yeah <laughs> yeah I was um you know for for the outs for the rest of the world the most defining factor about me is that I played Raphael the Ninja Turtle. That's how most people see me, and it's the first thing they can categorize. For me, again, on the other side, the most important characteristic for me is that I've been a martial artist now for over 40 years. Um, I started when I was 12, as you said. And, you know, in any culture, if you study any culture and see where a boy becomes a man, it's at that 12 to 13-year-old range. You know, that's when a boy's bar mitzvah, and that's when in certain tribes they send the kids out to go on these vision quests and things like that. So it just so happened for me, naturally, I fell into karate training at 12 years old. I had I'd been pushed around a little bit at school. I had seen some kids doing some martial arts stuff that I thought was cool and as you said, I just I went up to my dad and I said, "Hey, I really want to take karate. I'm interested in this." And it was 15 bucks a month. And my dad said, "All right." He th he figured it was going to be like any other hobby, like model rockets or those slot car racers and that I used to have and <laughs> he thought I would start and then just quit after a few months right. and lose interest. So he said, "All right, I'll pay for it." But if you quit, you have to pay me back for every month that I've paid for. It was 15 bucks a month at the time. And I was a kid. I was 12 <laughs> years old. I was like, whatever. I mean, money was right. nothing to me. Yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. So I signed up and started taking karate. Now, cut two years later when I've been doing it for a decade, and I would always fool around with my dad and be like, if I quit now, do I still owe you like 10 years of martial arts and all that <laughs> stuff? So yeah, I got involved in martial arts. I started taking a uh, Gojuru karate, which is an Okinawan form of karate. It's the kind that Miyagi teaches Daniel San in the Karate Kid movies, wax on, wax off. Uh, the character of Miyagi is actually named after Miyagi, the founder of Gojuru. And that's why he says, yes, my family discovered karate and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so I started in Gojuru karate. It became my obsession as a kid. Uh, I started competing. Um, I was pretty good at it. Uh, despite being, you know, a short kid. Um, I started competing around the country. I started winning. Uh, I eventually got my black belt at 17 years of age. So it took me about five years to get my black belt or so. And um, then went off to college. And once I went off to college, 
um, I did what a lot of people do in college. I started drinking a lot of beer and eating a lot of pizza and stuff. But I also was meeting other martial artists from other styles and systems and started just working out with different people. And that started to expand my horizons a little bit. Then as time went on, um, as soon as college was done, martial arts is what allowed me to get my job as a Ninja Turtle. Um, I had been, uh, when I was about 13 years old, as any kid who takes martial arts does, you fall in love with martial arts movies, Bruce right. Lee and Chuck Norris and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So I, my dad used to take me to go see these movies. This was before HBO and the internet and all that stuff. So you had to go to a movie theater to see Good Guys Were Black or Force of One with Chuck Norris. And uh, I remember sitting in the movie theater um, and I just looked up at the screen and I was watching these guys just kick ass for righteousness and all that stuff. And I thought, man, that's what I want to do. I want to be, first I thought, I wanted to do it in real life. I wanted to be like <laughs> like a CIA agent or something. And then I was like, no, wait, I just want to do it in the movies because yeah. then I can be a CIA agent one time and then I can be a soldier and then I can be a, a guy on a, a Mars fighting. And you don't have to get shot at. So. Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> Plus you make a lot of money and you fly yeah. in helicopters and limousines. You don't have to move the family every four years. Right. You know, to so, so getting into martial arts is what inspired me early on to then pursue my dreams of going towards the movies. So... Anyway, as I graduated college, my very first job after college was working on the Ninja Turtle movies and because they were in North Carolina where I grew up. And after that, I ended up moving to California. Once I moved to California, I started studying uh, Shaolin and Taoist Kung Fu, Tai Chi, uh, American Kempo. Now, can I ask you about that? Because yeah. I, mean, I, I saw a huge list of different art forms that you've uh, been involved with to include fencing. Did, <laughs> did you spend any time mastering any individual one of them or do you are you just becoming a more rounded martial artist with all of this knowledge from each different uh teaching i the last thing i'll say is that i became a master of any of them right, right. i will say that i'm a dilettante where i'm sticking my foot in the water on okay. a lot of things um now after having done this for 40 years um i approach it from basically what's a bruce lee perspective where i try to study as much as i can figure out what works for me and then just discard the rest. As Bruce Lee said, take what's useful and discard the rest. So um, I'm, I'm five, six and a half, right? I don't need the same techniques that a six foot tall, 140 pound Taekwondo guy does right. who can kick and spin and do all this other stuff. There's different things that work for me. So what I try to do is I study and learn as much as I can, whether it's with another instructor at a school. For instance, right now I'm studying in an Ishinru karate school, which is another Okinawan form of karate. Um, they're all born from the same primordial stew, but they have their differences. So I'm literally studying with a completely new system right now and learning all that stuff. But trying to learn as much as I can and bring it into... You know, Bruce Lee called his style Jeet Kune Do, and then, he, and then he regretted naming it for the rest of time because he said, you shouldn't have any kind of style. This, you should be the style of no style. You should be the style of Andrew or the style of Ken and just do what works for you. So I, I've gone around and, and trained in all these things for sometimes an insignificant period of time and sometimes for a very significant period of time. But what I try to do is I take what I can from that learning and then I incorporate it into my lifelong training. So I get together with other martial artists now, and we don't get together and do karate or do kung fu. We get together and we work on everything. And we'll, we'll do techniques that I've learned from this particular system, and then techniques from this system, and then we'll blend them together and all that kind of stuff. So it, And what does that look like? Is it just sparring? Y'all just get together and kind of freestyle spar? Or? No, that's part of it. There's a lot of... There, it's every... It's everything across the board it's uh we do forms and katas from different systems we'll work with weapons we practice self-defense techniques uh we do a lot of sparring uh we do conditioning we do basics really i hate jogging and swimming and all that stuff to try to stay in shape but i like doing martial arts it's fun it keeps your mind active right. it forces coordination on you and all that stuff so just figuring out ways to spend time. It's almost like martial arts boot camp when we get together and do stuff. It's a wide variety of things, and it can change at any time. And it's a, you know, if somebody has an idea of something they want to do, we'll give it a try. So we might go from practicing flying sidekicks um, to practicing a samurai sword two-man fighting routine. 
Um, you know, that sounds it, dangerous. Yeah, anything, anything, just to keep it active and, and alive. So as much as we can study and put together, that's kind of my goal right now. Yeah, I was really wondering about the fencing thing. <laughs> yeah, f- uh, fencing in particular was in college. Um, I I had to take a gym class. So the two gym classes I took in college were scuba diving, and I became a certified scuba diver and fencing. Okay. And you just uh, had to fill a credit, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I've <laughs> wanted to do something interesting. I've always yeah. been interested in fencing, especially as a combat sport athlete. And um, once I got into fencing, I kind of got hooked. So I went out and bought the equipment, and then I just joined the intramural fencing league in school. And fortunately, our coach at the University of North Carolina was also the coach for the U.S. Olympic team. Oh, so, damn. Yeah. So it's some really high-quality training going on in there. And then once I started doing that, and then reaching out and studying other martial arts, it was only after that that I realized and read so much about Bruce Lee and how he studied fencing and the footwork of fencing and the use of your arms and all that. And you find differences, you know, not that we don't we'll get mired in the details, but, you know, one of the differences between what Bruce Lee te- taught and what other systems teach is um, which hand is forward when you're fighting. Traditionally in boxing or, you know, here in the West, if you're right-handed, you stand with your left hand forward and your power hand is at the back and that's what you can hit with. But when you're a fencer, your power hand is in front because it's got the blade. Well, when Bruce Lee teaches fighting, he used to teach you keep your power hand in front because that's the one that's the most dexterous and can move for blocking and it's the strongest one to get the fastest hits in. So differences around there, but to see the comp, see the way that he took fencing and boxing and all those other things and brought it together with his Wing Chun base and created, you know, his ideas um, was motivational for me once I yeah. sort of got more into fencing and saw how it could be applicable. And so you're still sticking with it. You're uh, you're not doing any kind of competitions recently. You're in the future. It's more just about self-preservation and, and keeping up with the skills that you've been working on for a lifetime. Yeah, it's, in all honesty, it's about the pursuit of personal evolve, evolution and enlightenment. Sure. Um, you know, for me as a martial artist, it goes beyond the, hey, it's time to get dressed and go to the gym and work out. It's a daily life of meditation and reading and study. Um, and just, you know, what it's what's beautiful is it's all self-directed learning. So like right now, I'm deeply, deeply, for the last year, I've been in a deep immersion into samurai and buddhism and studying miyamoto musashi the sword saint of japan and some other great sword legends and seeing how all that stuff works so it's 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 really about learning beyond the physical techniques of martial arts and using it for your betterment as an individual these last couple of years with your interest in buddhism and everything else you just listed um is that where your most recent mantras are coming from? Like you mentioned a couple today during the uh, different podcasts I was listening to. The one that I do remember you saying is luck is uh, what happens at the intersection of uh, preparation and opportunity. And I think that anybody that uh, ha- has accomplished anything with a fair amount of luck can agree with you. And your story is definitely reflective of that. You were preparing from the age of 12, and the first time you had an opportunity, boom. You were, you were in the door, but that, that luck that you experienced was just an uh, intersection of opportunity and preparedness. So I was wondering if that's something that you adopted along the way, or if this is a mantra that you just kind of picked up recently, or is that how you've always lived your life? Did you know that if you were prepared that the opportunity would present itself? I had no clue whatsoever. I was, <laughs> I was fortunate to be following a blind passion with undeniability you know um napoleon hill wrote a book called think and grow rich right and in the book he he alludes to the secrets of success of the wealthiest and most successful people on earth in the book he never says what the secret is but he describes how it manifests and how you can see it in other people and what they're doing and ultimately what i took out of that book was the secret to success is the undeniability of what you're going to manifest. It's, you know, I, I don't care how many times you tell me no, I'm going to still find a way to do the thing I want to do because that's the way the world to me is supposed to be. I knew that I was going to be an action hero in the movies. I just knew it. There was no other course or concern for me. So I just put all my effort into doing those things and, 
and just became a steamroller. And I ran into a lot of no's and I just either went around them or went over them or did whatever it is to get by them. In my, the ignorance of my youth, I was basically just blessed with the fact that I was driven by such a hot passion. As time went on and I gained understanding, at least what I think is understanding of my universe, I realized that the law of attraction um, and synchronicity and all these other things, we can call it luck, but it's also, you know, vibrations that you put out there and things that happen. So for me, I eventually learned, yeah, if you tune into the things that you want to manifest, the things that you want to happen, it's hard to put these things into words because they go beyond words. You know, the map is not the territory. Um, but if you tune into those things and put all your effort and energy into it, and in Buddhism, they call that karma, right? If you do certain things, people believe, oh, karma is, you know, I, I did a bad thing now, so now a bad thing's going to happen to me later on. It's not quite so transactional. It's more... How do you live your life? How do you manifest your life? What are the actions you take every day? What are you going to do? It really comes down to you reap what you sow, right? So for me, I learned later on that all these things that we call luck and everything that I was doing was basically just karma in action. I was just reaping what I was sowing by blindly going after what I was trying to do and trying to do it correctly. You know, a lot of people do things like a dickhead (laughs) and, you know, uh, get and still get ahead. But that was never me, and growing up as a martial artist, my sense of sort of honor um, and the nobility that goes with being a warrior and what you're supposed to do in life, sometimes that kind of hamstrung me, uh, but oftentimes I think it it gave me a better outcome in life. Yeah, it's hard to believe living in uh, L.A. for 20 years with a strong moral compass, but then you ended up in Fort Worth, and that makes total sense. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You can tell I'm a little biased. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I, like it. I like Fort Worth. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I've I've lived a few other places. Actually, I was down in Austin for nine months just recently, and I came back real quick. Huh. I you know it's a great place to visit, but Fort Worth is home for sure. And your brother brought you here. Y'all moved from New York at age five, right? Yeah, I was born in New York, moved to North Carolina when I was five. And then your brother probably you know he he was specializing in something, found a good practice down here, and that's what brought him to Texas. Mm-hmm. And then you made your way. There was a mention of a, a movie that you were doing, and that had something to do with your move here to Texas, but but now, it was mostly your brother, right? Yeah, I, I mean, basically, I, I'd been in Los Angeles for 22 years, um, and I'd kind of seen my career go as far as it really was going to go. Yeah. Um, I was in my 40s, and I thought, you know, I've had all my breaks. I've I starred in some Ninja Turtle movies. I started in some martial arts films. Uh, I directed for television. I mean, I did a lot of stuff. Um, but I was ready for the next chapter in my life right. and it was like, what's it going to be? So I literally just started looking at like, okay, where can I go? What do I want to do next in this wandering spiritual journey of my life? And I, I was looking at entertaining places to go live. And, um, one of the reasons I wanted to get out of LA is because it can be a very lonely place. Even though there's 13 million people there when you're in the film industry, the film industry is not a team sport. Right. It's an individual game. There's only so many spots, right? <laughs> yeah, and and you don't need anybody else to succeed. I mean, you need agents <laughs> right. and managers and things like that at the right time in the right place, but you know, two friends can move to Los Angeles and one of them can have success and one of them can be completely unemployed yeah. and their lives are going to go on very different trajectories and who knows how they stay together or whatever. So Los Angeles is a terrible place to try to have good relationships because ultimately if you're in the film business or the music business, um, everybody's looking out for their next best opportunity. And if something comes along that's going to benefit them, a, they need to take it and B they're going to take it if they can, despite what it means to anything left in their wake. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I used to say like, man, don't, don't, don't ever date for me. I'm, I'm a guy. So I was like, uh, I had a rule. Don't date actresses, singers, bartenders, or waitresses. How often did you break that? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> but because, because everybody's living, everybody's living with insecurity. Everybody's, you know, living hand to mouth, trying to get to the next thing. And everybody's looking for a bigger, better deal. So for me, after 22 years of that in Los Angeles, there's this old joke that, 
you know, you can move to Los Angeles with three friends. And when you leave Los Angeles, you'll have three friends. <laughs> so after 22 years, I was kind of like, I was isolated from my family. My, uh, my dad was living in Florida. My mom was living in Washington, DC. My brother was living in Texas and I was in California. So I didn't really have anybody. I was just a single guy in my forties. So I decided for the next phase of my life, I wanted to be closer to somebody in my family because I think I, I, was, I got the feeling that that was more important for me now than it was back then. Yeah. So I thought about DC moving near my mom, but that was crazy. DC's a fortune to live and there's no, you know, it's crazy, but man, my mom lives in beautiful. She lives right on Pennsylvania Avenue. Oh. Um, so anyway, I moved, I visited here for the last 20 years, visiting my brother. I thought Fort Worth was kind of cool. There was no state income tax. I was like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I came to Fort Worth and it's been great ever since. That was eight years ago and I've loved it ever since. I found a home here. You kind of answered this a minute ago, but uh, you know, you, you've done just about everything inside the movie, movie industry and you've produced, you've directed, you've been the stunt guy, acting roles, all of it. Um, is that pretty much over? I mean, you, you said that's kind of concluded your time in LA. Do you think you'll ever direct, produce, or otherwise be in a movie? I currently still do some directing for TV commercials and stuff. I work in marketing now. Right. So I still get to stretch my creative muscles a little bit. Um, also creatively, I still play music, and I'm sure I'll still be involved and do some stage work and stuff doing that. But um, no, I don't see myself really... I mean, I've been in front... In all honesty, I've been in front of the camera a couple times over the last few years just for some cameo commercial stuff that I've done. But no, I don't really see anything happening unless, you know, if somebody came back and said, hey, it's time to make Showdown 2 or something right. like that. People always ask me, they go, hey, if they make another Ninja Turtle movie, are you going to be part of it? I'm like, dude, first of all, I'm in my mid-50s now. If I put on a 65-pound foam latex suit, I'd have a heart attack. <laughs> So yeah, I don't I don't foresee anything happening. You never say never, though. You know. Yeah. Well, and this is something I wanted to touch on with you too because it's changed so much since 1990, whenever the first uh, Ninja Turtle movie was made. Practical versus CGI, um, and we're at a point now where CGI is just absolutely incredible. Uh, Ten years ago, it really you know it was disturbing that they would uh, substitute an actual character for the CGI because it just wasn't there yet. There's a commercial on TV right now with LeBron James talking to himself when he's like 14 or something. And it's a CGI of LeBron James and LeBron when he's 14. And it's spooky. Like undiscernible or just... No, no, because it's... You know, they still... They're so close, but they still haven't perfected life in the eyes. Right. The eyes always sort of have this kind of vacant un inability to really look at something. <sighs> And so I'm watching this commercial and it's still creepy, you know, mm -hmm. it's still creepy cause it's just not quite right. Um, but it's getting so close yeah. that these deep fakes and everything mm -hmm. that you can do now, it's incredible. Yeah. But S some of them I've seen and you, you really have to study it for a minute Yeah. to, and, and the, the hardest ones to determine are the ones where they're kind of panned out a little bit. Now that one where he's in the mirror, I haven't seen it, but I'd imagine you got a pretty up close look at the eyes. You'll see it. It's uh, that's it's, nuts. It's weird and creepy. But, but I think uh, you know, and I'm not sure what the specifics of your question were, but I can address well, just, just the practical the, versus the magic CGI. that's been lost there. Because I in 1990 when the Ninja Turtles came out, um, that was brand new technology. Nobody had ever done that before, and that and from that point on forward, the uh, practical. Uh, makeup or costumes or whatever you want to call it uh, was really advanced and it was really starting to look cool and uh there are some movies some really ridley scott movies and otherwise that capitalize on that and they still use practical uh makeup and and art uh, in their films and those those seem to have a tangible quality that you can't get with cgi well i think you hit it on the head when you said a tangible quality you know the difference is the the undescribable and sometimes unrecognizable visceral reaction you have to what you're seeing on screen. Um, for me, I relate it specifically to stunts. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up wanting to do stunts and action and all that. I loved everything about stunts and behind the scenes movies and all this kind of things that you could see about how Hal Needham and all these guys were, were doing what they were doing. Dar Robinson and all the great uh, stunt guys and coordinators. 
And then as CGI came into play and you started having, you know, actors on a crowded freeway and cars going by them and it's obviously CGI, it looks neat and you, and the joke is still there in the film, but you don't have that sweaty palm heart sick feeling about, oh my God, what that, that just happened. Yeah. Because there's just that little bit of unreality that's still there. Now, again, they'll surpass this as technology continues to get better and better. And they're, they're so much further along than they were just, you know, in our lifetimes. But I, I remember this one. I don't know why this stupid movie sticks in my head, but there was one movie with Eddie Murphy and Steve Martin called Bowfinger. And they were, they played movie producers and in the movie, they were trying to make this low budget movie themselves. And in one of the scenes, they had Eddie Murphy's character try to run across the 405 freeway in Los Angeles with traffic just running by. Well, in the film, it's so obvious that it's Eddie Murphy in like some kind of layered computer generated cars and oh. things going by. So you just don't buy it. Yeah. They're just like the thrill's not there. And so everything they're trying to create that the tension, the worry, is he going to get hit? Is it, it's just not there. Yeah. And so when you look at things like Ninja Turtles, you know, the original Ninja Turtles, we had Jim Henson develop puppet tectronics, which you named, which was the, um, the fanciest animatronics of the time, fancier than any Disney parks, anything. But those turtles, man, you can touch them. You can reach out right. and poke them, and and they're there, and they're in the scene, and they're casting shadows, and they're, there's a certain energy that's there versus you look at the CGI turtles. And whether you think they look great or grotesque or whatever they are... You know they're real. They're there, right. But those CGI ones, they're not. They're yeah. Sometimes they'll get you. You'll get caught up in the drama, and hopefully the directors are good enough, whatever the film is, whether it's Ninja Turtles or something, that you can overcome the CGI, and they do. You know, there's a lot of movies, Avatar and things like that. I was about to say, Avatar, I think, yeah. is the only one that's got me kind of gripping my seat. Right. They did a good job. And yeah. then, you know, and then, and you look at another extreme in another way, like Pixar, right? Pixar is not trying to look real. Mm hmm. But yet, at the same time, they make some of the most emotionally heart-rending movies you could possibly see. I mean, they're, they're some of the best filmmakers on the planet making yeah. those movies. But it's all CGI stuff, right. but it's not trying to imitate you know humanity. Although those worlds are converging more and more and more. So, uh, you use the word intangible. It's that visceral connection to a tangible thing that I think makes the difference. And... As long as they continue to smooth that out, it's just going to get better and better. But right now, for those of us that choose or want to be purists or stand on, <laughs> a, you know, shaky ground of that like that, that's the thing that really stands out. There, there is one story that uh, only got brought up one time today while I was listening to all the different podcasts, and it was your time in the creature cave. Whenever they're uh, getting your mold ready. <laughs> I had to ask you about this one because I I died laughing. I had to stop what I was doing and just take a minute because that that was that was pretty excellent. This uh, sort of alludes back to my porn career that we were talking about <laughs> earlier. Um, now I've got to include that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when um, when they make a Ninja Turtle suit or they make any kind of body costume for you for a movie, the first thing they have to do is take a mold of your body, very specifically, of every nook and cranny and crevice. Because ultimately, when they end up finishing making the suit, it's custom form fitted to your body. So the first step you go through is they have to encase you completely in plaster of Paris. And once you're encased in plaster of Paris, you sit there for 20 or 30 minutes while it dries. And then they take a hammer and chisel and they split the whole thing in half. You step out. And then when they put it together, they basically have a negative form of your body that they can fill. And so... So they did that for me. They made us. They, they had to make a statue out of my body. Well, in order to make this statue, and this is the exact same thing they did for David Bowie in Labyrinth, right? Because he had all kinds of body suits and everything. So when I, I flew to London and I went to the Jim Henson Creature Shop in London, which is a very unassuming place. It doesn't look like a Muppet factory or anything. It just looks like some artist's garage, really, just bigger. And um, they sent me down into the basement. And down in the basement, there's like these five or six Cockney guys that they're all like football hooligans, really. And they're sort of like the Oompa Loompas of the Muppet uh, world, where they run around and they do all this stuff, and they're the plasterers, and they're, they're just kind of the laborers of uh, the creature shop. 
Well, they had me stand in this one area, which is the exact same place David Bowie had to stand to do his stuff. And then they, they basically, it almost looks like they crucify you. They, you. they hold your arms out to the side and they tie your arms, they tie loops around your wrists and they hang you from the ceiling, just your arms. So you're standing there with your arms completely extended out to the side and you're wearing basically just a skin tight lycra body suit, like a dancer would wear in ballet, a male dancer. Well, when you're wearing a skin tight lycra body suit, you can see everything about you. You know, you can, if you got a dime in your pocket, you can read the date on it and you can certainly tell whether you're Jewish or not. <laughs> so as I'm sitting there in the basement and all these guys start to get this plaster of Paris, they're putting these bandages in warm water and then they start slapping it all over your body. Now I'm at this point, I'm like 22 years old. I'm in great shape. My heart's pumping. My circulation is fantastic. And I've got somebody down on their knees putting hot, wet <laughs> plaster of Paris around my crotch. Now, without even thinking about it, and it's not certainly not assigning any gender one way or the other, when you have hot, warm plaster of Paris around your nether regions... Biology's taken over. Yeah, you're certainly going to vasodilate your uh, you know, vascular system. Everything's going to open up and blood's going to flow. <laughs> So blood started flowing to the lower regions of my body. And I started to have a reaction such that the guy who was on his knees putting the plaster of Paris on looked up at me and goes, oh, you getting a little excited? <laughs> and without even missing a beat, I said, well, you're just so cute. <laughs> Did he think it was funny? Oh, yeah. We were, okay. we were all, all right. laughing. I'm, I'm sure it's not the first time it happened. Maybe it is. I don't know. But... So then what happened was they proceeded to make my plaster of Paris body mold. Well, Too late to stop now. Yeah. When they took the cast <laughs> off, Raphael turned out to be very well endowed. <laughs> and so once they made the statues of our bodies so that they could make the, co the costumes out of them, um, the statues were made out of fiberglass. And so mine was red fiberglass. The guy that played Donatello, his was purple and Leo's was blue and Mike's was orange. So in the creature shop, you could see these four statues of the actors and they, they almost look like corpses, but they're standing up and there's all of them and there's Raphael. And when you know it, Raphael was well, well endowed at that point. <laughs> now, I didn't think too much of it. It was no big deal. I, I was like, all right, well, by the time they sculpt the costume on and everything, it'll be fine. No worries. So they did the whole costume and all that stuff. We all kind of laughed about it. And then at one point, all four of us turtles later on were on the set and we were resting in between a shot and we were all sitting there, just sitting down in our full turtle suits. And one of the girls from the wardrobe department walked by and she goes, my God, Raphael has a big package. <laughs> and I was like, well, there you go. I guess you can't hide it. You credited that as one of your uh, best moments in life. Yeah, I really felt yeah. like that was me rising <laughs> to the occasion. You know? Ken, what's, uh, what's next, man? I, here in Fort Worth, you've already told us that you got several projects going on. We know you're in the process of writing another book. Uh, you're spending a lot of time with uh, nerdy little podcasters, helping them out with their show. Uh, very appreciative, by the way. Love it. Uh, <laughs> Um, but what's what? What do you think is next? Are you going to take the marketing uh, campaigns in a different direction? Are you, you got any other projects on the horizon? Well, yeah, I, I appreciate that question too because just at the end of last year, after all this pandemic stuff and everybody's life getting turned upside down and everything, I realized that like a whole year or more had slipped by, and all I had really been doing was surviving. Mm -hmm. All I was doing was just working. I work, I'm a chief marketing officer now for a corporation. So I just, I do marketing work. Um, I was just working out. I was doing my martial arts. I was working and walking my dog and just kind of going about daily life. And outside of that, which isn't bad, I realized I didn't really have any immediate goals. I didn't have a, for lack of a better word, and this isn't the right word, but for lack of a better word, I didn't really wake up with a purpose, right. you know? We talked earlier about my brother and his band and the traumatics and all that and how that's given him such great purpose now. And again, I'm not speaking in the wild, full effects of life. You know, our purpose is to be good people and all that right, stuff. Right. But just purpose, just what am I going to do today? How am I going to spend my time? How am I going to do things? 
So at the end of last year, 2021, I sat down and I came up with a bunch of goals for this year, things that I wanted to do. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was I set a new uh, fitness goal for myself. Um, I've been working out regularly, but I also wanted to get back in like really awesome, awesome shape. Like, I mean, I used to work in the movies, so we're talking yeah. abs and the whole deal, right? So the first thing I did is I set a goal to lose 20 pounds and uh, get my fitness program on. So I started the year with a 21-day intensive samurai training immersion thing. And I did it. I ended up losing all the weight and doing the thing. And So my goal was to lose this weight and then get a tattoo. I haven't gotten the tattoo yet because I'm still figuring out what it's going to well, be. Well, I did but see your before and after pictures from this little challenge. And my yeah. God, man. Yeah. And for the people that are listening and not watching the YouTube video, he's, he's sitting here. He's... He's being very modest. He's he's swole. He's he's ripped. <laughs> well, I'm tr I'm trying to do that. So anyway, so my goals were I wanted to try and get in better shape, which I'm doing. Um, I wanted to finish my second book, so I'm now fifty five thousand words into the book. The last book was sixty six thousand words, so I'm getting close. Um, but to be honest, I really have to overwrite and then right. edit back. Right. So I'm I'm probably about three quarters of the way through it, really. So I wanted to write a second book. Um, I'm trying to uh, get into some real estate stuff. I, I made my first real estate deal last uh, year, so I'm trying to do another one of those. Um, and then I want to learn how to make pizza. <laughs> I love pizza. It's my favorite food. Someday I want to own a pizza place, um, but I don't make pizza, so I'm setting a goal <laughs> this year to build a pizza oven in my backyard and uh, learn, experiment with different doughs and things like that and do all that. Um Outside of that, the other sort of creatively speaking, besides writing the book, is um, musically. Um, before this year is out, I plan on putting together a um, a musical show um, of just original rock and roll stuff and finding a place and performing it and putting together the band. So I've been working with some other musicians to do all that for fun. Um, that's really it. And then other than that, uh, working in my job and, and making television and radio commercials. Yeah. Well, I love the energy uh, on all your social media and everything you're doing, your website. Uh, it's clear that you have a passion for the stuff that you're doing, and uh, it's you can see it. You can see the energy coming through your work, so keep it up, that. man. Um, where can people find your content? And this will be all in the show notes, but I give everybody an opportunity yeah, no, to <laughs> shout out whatever they want. I, You know, the first place I always tell people to go is go to turtleconfessions.com. Right. If you go to turtleconfessions.com, there's all kinds of videos that I put up there talking about making the Ninja Turtle movies. You can find links on Amazon to buy the, my book there. It's only 10 bucks right now f for people who are Ninja Turtle fans. Um, that's really a labor of love. I couldn't give a shit if somebody buys the book or not. I'm not making any money off it. Listen, I didn't do it for money. Um, I literally did it because for 30 years of people asking these things, this was sort yeah. of a chance for me to you know share it with people. Yeah. So I always tell people at Comic-Cons and when I meet them, I go, look, if you really love the original Ninja Turtle thing, movies, you will love this book. Yeah. So go check it out. For so, people listening, real quick, that's Teenage Ninja to Mutant Turtle uh, becoming the real... Raphael, and he intentionally spelt real with two E's. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, you know, you know why? Because you <laughs> what, what happens is um, I'll be out at a lot of social stuff, and invariably this happens in my life. Somebody will go, hey, this is my friend Ken. You know, he was a Ninja Turtle. And people kind of go, oh, okay. They don't know, does that mean I dress up at kids' birthday parties? Right. <laughs> Did I have something to do with a cartoon? Did I, was I, I mean, there's so many things that could be, they have no idea. And even people then even try and further define it and they'll go, no, he's one of the OG turtles, seriously. And they're like, oh, and this is what I have to do all the time. I go, look, let me explain what my friend's trying to say. Did you ever see the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from 1990? Yeah, I'm the guy in the suit playing the red. And then they go, oh, I get it. <laughs> so on the book, because there's so many people that are cartoon voices and concerts and all that, I put that R-E-E-L to be the movie turtle. So yeah. people can go to turtleconfessions.com, check out my author website. You can find me on Instagram at Kenjitsu with two N's. Um, and that's K-E-N-N-J-I-T-S-U. And then on Facebook, you can find me at Ken Scott dash Raphael. Awesome. And that will be in the show notes. So y'all didn't have to write that down. You can scroll back and look at that. We're at an hour or two. Do I have time for one more question? Sure. I thought of this as we were going through all my poorly written notes, but um, I think I heard, and I didn't have time to go back and check this, but all of your uh, Ninja Turtle stuff started 
from you sneaking into the set disguised as a pizza delivery guy. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, once again, pizza comes up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, what happened was I was going to college in North Carolina, and I was doing everything I could to prepare to be move to Hollywood and be an action hero once I graduated college. Well, somehow, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, famous movie producer, built a movie studio in North Carolina uh, at the beach, which is about three and a half, four hours from where I lived. So during the summers, I would drive down there, rent an apartment for two or three months, and just try to figure out how to work as an extra or break into the movies. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just blindly going after. And the movies were there. They weren't in my neighborhood. So I went down there and just hung around trying to figure out how to get in. <laughs> so the movie studio was there in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And it's not like you can just walk up to a movie studio and they'll let you in. It's a, you right. know, there's, there are gates security. and walls. And, <laughs> and this was all pre-9-11. So when it came to security, there was a literally just like, you know, a retired guy sitting in a guard shack. Like nine bucks an hour. Yeah. Not, not like it is today. Right, right. And so I, I knew somehow, I didn't know what it was, but I knew that there was some kind of holy grail on the other side of that fence. <laughs> Somewhere in that movie studio was some magic orb that was going to give me all my dreams. I just didn't know what it was. And I just had to get in there. Well, I couldn't figure out how to get in. And finally it dawned on me one time that everybody likes the pizza guy <laughs> nobody's going to turn down the pizza guy he's right. bringing fresh delicious pizza that somebody wants so i got a domino's pizza delivery uniform i got a couple domino's pizza boxes i set them on the seat of my car and i just drove up to the guard shack and i was super nervous my palms were sweating and uh, the guard came out of the gate he's like, what can i do for you and i said uh yeah i have a delivery for the production i didn't know what was going on i didn't know there was anybody producing a movie at that time or anything and uh, the guy looked at me, and he kind of leaned down. I thought he was going to grab me. I mean, I, th I, was, I was really nervous. And he said, uh, okay, well, just follow the yellow line and drive on back. You'll see all the cars parked. Just go park back there. Because he wasn't going to stop somebody. He doesn't know. Maybe the director ordered a pizza, you know? Right. And he doesn't want to get in trouble for that. His ass, yeah. So he, so he raised the little gate, and I drove right on by, and I was like, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> So I drove in. And you knew where to go. Well, I followed the line, yeah. <laughs> I found I found where I could park, and I was like, you know, I'm looking around, and at the time, I, I, I had a denim jacket, a jeans jacket. I put it over my Domino's thing so nobody could see the Domino's shirt, took off the Domino's hat, and then just got out of the car, and I'd seen enough movie sets around town and stuff that there's a lot of people around. If, if you're just ninja-like... You can kind of fade into the background. Don't be an idiot and make yourself noticed. So I kind of faded into the background. I just started watching. They were making a movie. They were shooting this movie that had a, there was a gunfight going on and a car screeching around the corner and there was a famous stunt coordinator there. And I was just like, man, this is amazing. So ultimately, I ended up meeting the people that cast the extras in that movie. And we just got to talking and, you know, they weren't worried about who I was or anything. They just thought I might be visiting the brother of somebody right, right. on the set. We got to talking. I, I told them I was a martial artist and all that. And eventually they were like, well, you know, we have a project coming. It's a secret. We can't tell you what it is, but we think we have a film coming and we're going to be auditioning local martial artists. So if you'd like to audition, let us know. And I was like, yes, that's why I'm here. I knew the golden orb was so yeah. this side of the thing. <laughs> so ultimately it, it took a long time. It took about a year after that where the secret project eventually did come to North Carolina. Cause at one point it was going to go to Canada because of tax incentives and they didn't, they brought it back to North Carolina. I got a call from those people. I went and I drove three hours back to the beach, four hours back to the beach and auditioned for the stunt coordinator and ended up getting hired as one of the foot soldiers in the movie. And then from that point, then my journey started and I went from foot soldier to talking foot soldier to stunt Raphael to acting Raphael all the yeah. way through. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure the absurdity that you got into the whole thing with pizza wasn't lost on yeah, you. Yeah. No, trust me. <laughs> Ken, thank you so much, man. Yeah. You didn't have to do this. I'm oh, it's my pleasure. Unbelievably grateful. Um, we got to do it again. Yeah. I, I know you're a busy dude, but uh, you got another book coming up. If one of your projects, you want to uh, talk about that on the show, we're happy to put that out to the public for you. Right on, man. And next time we'll talk about uh, lacrosse. 
Lacrosse, yes. Yeah. Uh, we actually were at the opening day for uh, Panther City Lacrosse Club. Yep. And uh, they just great. had their first winning game the other day. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it took them eight tries, but they got it. Hey, we're an expansion team. It's going to take a little while. It's going to take a little all while. All right. Fort Worth Roots, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. A huge thank you to our guest today, Ken, for being on Fort Worth Roots Podcast. Man, thank you so much. It, it's not lost on me that people do not have to do this. And I'm so grateful for every guest that we have on the show. Getting to record this out at uh, Nexum Creative Media with your friend Paul. Uh, getting to hang out with uh, one of my childhood legends. And uh, then getting to run into you at Twilight and seeing your brother play and and your group of friends and everybody's hanging out, interacting, having a good time. It was, it was awesome. Anyway, I'm I'm taken by it. I'm I'm very honored. Thank you very much for being a, a part of the show, and I hope we get to do some more in the near future. Some of the stuff we were talking about on the show, uh, I'm going to put all this in the show notes because I I'm listening to it. I'm writing it down, and I uh, don't know that I've spelt any of this correctly. But uh, we we talked about some restaurants. Fo Hung on Camp Bowie. There's Los Has, uh, Hasaderos, Asaderos, North Fort Worth, and then uh, right around the corner from that, Nuevo Leon. And uh, I'm going to try to look those up and put them in the show notes. Uh, but these were suggestions by our, our friend today, Ken, told us we need to check these out. We need to eat here and, and try it out. It's good grub. Uh, and he's from L.A., so you know he's got to be right, right? Not from L.A., but... You, you listen to the episode. You know the story. Um, and he said Zoli's over in he, off of uh, Hewlin in Fort Worth. He said that was a really cool place. So Sunday, today, I went over there and I tried it out. And he wasn't wrong. It's incredible. You got to check it out. It's called Zoli's. It's off of Hewlin Street. Um, and it's r- real damn good. And it's very, very kid-friendly. I think every table there except for ours had kiddos hanging out. So anyway, that's it. Um, those were the, the big important notes. I'm also going to look up this podcast called Spear Talk. Um, like I mentioned in the episode that we did with Ken, everybody really piled into the uh, Raphael story whenever they were talking to Ken. And I wanted to do something a little different today. Now, there's going to be a, <laughs> there's probably going to be some disappointed people here because whenever I tell you that I, I did an interview with one of the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you're probably wanting to hear all about that. Um, we'll have time for that. We're going to get Kim back on to talk about his next book release. And, um, we'll, we'll talk more about Raphael then, but I wanted to definitely make sure that we talked about things that were important to Ken and kind of dive into some of that. Now I've got some movies that he's made that I've got to watch. I've got some books to read. I'm going to be way more prepared for this next one. And maybe I could get, uh, Ken, uh, and Steve, uh, on the show at the same time. That'd be ridiculous. I'd probably just leave the room so that they <laughs> they could talk it up. So, I don't know. We'll see. It's going to be cool anyway. What am I forgetting? River Oaks Car Show, April 30th. Please be there. Um, and then our friend uh, Joe Guzman from Episode 70. He's got the Psychedelic Panther, Main at Southside, April 15th through the 17th. And uh, he told me the prices, and I forgot, and I don't see it written on anything right now, but it's, it's fairly cheap. You can either do a... Uh, all weekend pass, or you can just pay for a day pass. So, but this is a great way for you to support these musicians, um, and all at one time, all one central location. And uh, our buddy Joe, I mean, the, if you could imagine yourself just going out on a limb to support something like this, you know, to going out there and try to support local musicians, he's doing all this basically on his own. He does have some people that are helping him with the the, the big details, but uh. This was his idea. This is his baby. And he's he's doing it almost entirely independently. So um, we'd like to see it succeed. And uh, it's going to be a great time. Main at Southside is an awesome venue. And uh, I, I know uh, a handful of the bands that are going to be there. And they're great. I can only assume that the rest of them are going to be incredible as well. Uh, there's going to be vendors out there too. So it's going to be a good time. April 15th through the 17th, Main at Southside. Is that it? Boys camping. Get your boys outside. Squadstx.com. 
check into that. Uh, give your kids a memory they're never going to forget. You know just as well as I do that the stuff that you remember the most from being a kid is when you're outside messing around, whether it was camping or just playing with a damn stick. We did all the notes. We said all the things. I, I know I'm forgetting stuff. There's going to be show notes, so I'll have a chance to redeem myself in the show notes. If I forgot anything that uh, needs to be added to the show notes, please hit me up. Media at FortWorthRoots.com. Let me know where I screwed up. I can always add to the show notes. Okie dokie. That's it. Thank you all for listening, and I will see you hopefully Thursday. But don't get that in your head. That's going to be an extra episode. We are a a once-a-week release podcast every Monday. So let's just leave it with that. Let's just pretend like I'll see you Monday And maybe there will be one Thursday. Our next episode up is going to be with Trista Morris. Uh, She's been on the show twice with Matthew Broyles. uh, And we've kind of lightly talked about her art in the past. But this episode uh, that's coming up next with Trista is going to be about her and her art and a mural that she just finished for the City of River Oaks off of Boulevard Brew, which is a coffee shop on the the main drag there. I never can remember the name of that road, but it's the one that goes past the base and into river oaks um anyway good episode glad to have trista back on and that's the one you can expect coming out next so all right that's it thanks and i'll see you soon bye